This week, the Democratic candidates vying to take on President Trump hold another debate. And our latest CBS News Battleground Tracker gives us a look at where they stand in the early contests. There are 18 states in our aggregate survey, starting with the Iowa caucus up through Super Tuesday. Former Vice President Joe Biden is back on top, now at 29 percent support, followed by Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren at 26 percent. Warren had led last month. Behind them, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders is at 18 percent. South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg has risen to 9 percent, and California Senator Kamala Harris is at 7 percent. The remainder of the field comes in with 2 percent of the vote or less. Joining us to talk about what's happening here is CBS News Elections and Surveys Director Anthony Salvanto. Anthony, always good to have you here. Thank you. So explain what you think is happening here with Elizabeth Warren. There have been some criticisms that perhaps she's too progressive, too liberal. Is that impacting her. Well, her opponents certainly have leveled those criticisms. It may be having some impact in this sense. We see 36 percent of Democrats, and in particular those not yet considering her, say that her plans would be too liberal to defeat Donald Trump. Only 6 percent, for example, say that about what they think of Joe Biden's plans. It's a reminder that throughout this campaign, the key criteria for Democrats has been trying to game out who they think can defeat Donald Trump. There's another break here in that Democrats describe Elizabeth Warren as exciting in a way that they do not describe Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. But more of them also describe her as risky in a way that they do not describe Joe Biden. So to the extent that some of these supporters of either candidate have been moving back and forth, this month the ones that she's lost has gone to either Joe Biden or also to Pete Buttigieg. And he, the mayor uh, of South Bend, has been getting a lot of attention for moving ahead in two key states. Right. Um, big move in Iowa. We saw, saw that start to happen in the, at the end of the summer, but now he's really vaulted into what's, what's essentially a tie for the lead there in Iowa. Also made a big move in New Hampshire. Now, Warren still leads in New Hampshire, but he's up nine points there and is now into double digits. One of the things that struck me is that he's doing particularly well with people who say they're paying attention to the campaign, but not following it as closely on social media and on Twitter. Now, that could mean that all that groundwork that he's doing, the mm -hmm. campaigning he's doing there, the events in Iowa, New Hampshire, is starting to pay off. So one of the things that you also found is that there's generally satisfaction with the field. So if that is the case, then why are you hearing from potential candidates that they may see an opening? Yeah, it's almost eight in 10 Democrats who say that they are satisfied with their current crop of candidates. And that's higher than that number has been in some recent past elections. But you also see that, number one, they're not necessarily set in their choice themselves. And I think it's also a function partly of the rules, by which I mean this. We asked about Mike Bloomberg mm -hmm. and whether or not voters would consider voting for him, and 20 percent said that they would. Now, that's not out of the picture, but it's not the same level that we see for consideration of some of these top-tier candidates. Having said that, remember, this is a delegate fight, and these early states don't have that many delegates. They're attention plays, they're media plays, especially for candidates who aren't that well-known nationally. But after those early states, the Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina, there's 10 times as many delegates available on Super Tuesday. So conceivably, a candidate could go out there and pick up delegates in those states and pockets of those states. Normally, a candidate needs a lot of money to do that. You're like describing that. Mike Bloomberg, which, <laughs> like, and his strategy uh, is to skip some of these early states that yeah. we've talked about, the New Hampshire's and the Iowa's saying, I don't need it. Right. And, and I've got the money to run anyway. Right. So if a candidate doesn't need for all of us to go cover their victory speech in an Iowa or New Hampshire and can go right to Super Tuesday, that would seem to be the strategy. Whether or not it works would be an historic test, but a candidate would need a lot of money to do it. So in other words, to the question of is it too late, the answer is? Well, the answer is the rules make it possible for a candidate with enough money who can pick up enough attention after the early states. All right, Anthony Salvanto, thank you very much. The full results are on our website at facethenation.com. We will be back in a moment with our political panel.
It's time now for some political analysis. On my right, we are joined by Rachel Bade, who covers Congress for The Washington Post. CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe is also here. Molly Ball is the national political correspondent at Time Magazine. And Ramesh Panuru is a senior editor at the National Review and a columnist at Bloomberg Opinion. Uh, let's start off on 2020. Uh, as you just heard Anthony Salvanto lay out in the battleground tracker, there's some concern among Democrats that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren may be too liberal. President Obama got to something uh, along these lines this week. That's right. Friday night uh, here in Washington at a gathering of liberal donors didn't call out any specific candidate or idea, but did warn that the country isn't necessarily in the mood to rip up the entire system when it comes to health care and immigration. So that's kind of a veiled message to voters and to Democratic activists. Maybe Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren are going a little too far. And I think that's not only reflected in what the former president said, it's reflected in the results of the elections the last few days here. Look at what happened in Louisiana last night. John Bell Edwards, moderate Democrat, uh, anti-abortion, who has distanced himself from national Democrats, won in a squeaker just a few days after Annie Bashir won in Kentucky as a moderate as well. It's a reminder that if the party hopes to win back areas of the country that are trickier to prevail in, they're probably going to have to find a more moderate candidate to do it, and the polling is starting to reflect an understanding of that. And it's interesting, Rachel, because Speaker Pelosi told me something similar on Friday when I talked to her, when I specifically asked about that signature health care issue. Listen in. But I don't think that you can decide one day that in a matter of days that nobody will have their private health insurance. I, I just don't see that as a path. And I do think that though people have their exuberance and their why, and what excites them about running for office. And that has to be taken into consideration when we make judgments about their policies, because everybody knows that once you're elected, then you have to work together. So there you hear a master legislator basically saying what you're being promised on the campaign trail is going to be really hard to put through into law. Yeah, I mean, Pelosi and Obama uh, both sending up a red flare right now to these liberals in the 2020 race. I mean, this is a woman who comes from San Francisco. She's uh, as blue as you can be, but she's also, she's, you know, taken back the House. Uh, she has seen her moderate members take Republican districts that Trump won in in 2016. And she knows that messages like Medicare for all and we're going to take your health insurance, that scares a lot of independent voters and a lot of Republican voters who are sick of Trump and want someone else to vote for but can't see themselves voting for someone like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders who are promoting a lot of free things that people are worried about their own taxes and what that's going to do to their bottom line. Ramesh, I mean, as someone on the other side, do you think that there is anyone on the field or hinting who might be entering the field that could attract some Republican votes? I think that the more conservative or moderate the Democrats choose a nominee, the more likelihood they're getting crossover voters, not just Republicans, but maybe people who have voted Republican in the past some of the time, voted Democratic some of the time, but some stances like taking away private health insurance or um, moving away from enforcement of the immigration laws altogether, those things I think are going to make people not want to cross the aisle and write off some of those Democratic candidates. And I think what you're seeing on the Democratic polling right now is it's a fluid situation, mm -hmm. partly because there are these doubts about the top candidates. Just a couple of weeks ago, people were talking about, oh, this is really a Warren-Biden race, or even Warren's the front runner. And I think Democratic voters are taking a look and saying, well, not so fast. We've got some time to make up our minds, and we have some concerns about who's the right person to do this job, including beating Trump in the first place. And they may have more choices. As we learned this week, Deval Patrick, the former uh, governor of Massachusetts, did get in. Mike Bloomberg still flirting here. And then I, I want to play this soundbite here. Hillary Clinton said something kind of mysterious. I, as I say, never, never, never say never. Um, and I, I will certainly tell you I'm under enormous pressure from many, many, many people to think about it. But as of this moment, sitting here in this studio talking to you, that is absolutely not in my plans. Molly, who is pressuring Hillary Clinton to enter this race? 
Apparently, some people are. Either that or what she learned from running against Trump in 2016 is the art of trolling, and she's trolling <laughs> us all, which I think is quite possible because she knows how she makes people's heads explode sort of on both sides. I take her at her word that this is a remote possibility if it even exists. But as you mentioned, with these other late entrants into the race, there is a sense in the Democratic establishment, not necessarily the Democratic electorate, but the Democratic establishment, they're nervous about the about finding someone to coalesce behind that they see as acceptable, that they see as electable. Uh, and again, I don't think you find this in the electorate. In polls, mm -hmm. the vast majority of Democratic primary voters are happy with their choices. They have an embarrassment of riches. They've got 20 odd candidates. And what I hear when I'm out on the campaign trail talking to voters in places like Iowa is, gosh, there are so many great possibilities. How It's hard to choose. It's hard. Mm -hmm. It's been hard for them to narrow down. They don't hate any of these people. They just like somebody better. But right. that has left the race very fluid and unsettled at a time when I would have expected it to be gelling and coming into focus. It seems to be doing the opposite. When will Mike Bloomberg make a decision? We are told this morning, Margaret, that he is days away from making a formal announcement of his decision. Uh, the An announcement of a decision. Right. But we don't know what the decision is. We don't know what the okay. decision is. We know he's still considering it. But anybody who puts their name on the ballot now in Arkansas and Alabama, which had the earliest filing deadlines and will vote on Super Tuesday, and has requested the paperwork from Tennessee, another Super Tuesday state, is certainly signaling that he would like to at least load test the theory, and he has the money to do it, that you can bypass those first four states and focus on the nearly, what is it, 13 to 1,500 delegates that are up for grabs on Super Tuesday and potentially run the table in those states by running big ad campaigns and showing up. And you mm -hmm. saw when he went to Arkansas this past week to file paperwork, they were thrilled to see him because they hadn't seen any other candidate. And so if by <laughs> virtue of just showing up, he can do that and spend money, perhaps he's, he's able to wait out whoever prevails in the first four states. But to Molly's point, and I think it's important to reiterate this, because I've seen it in our reporting, our, our colleagues who are on the ground in these states have seen it as well, and the mm -hmm. polling now backs this up. 78% of Democrats in these first 18 states tell us in the battleground tracker they are satisfied with their choices. Only 22% say they want more yeah. choices, and only one in five of these Democratic primary voters say they would even consider Bloomberg as a possible candidate. Molly, what are you hearing in terms of how impeachment resonates? on the campaign trail. Well, it's very interesting that there hasn't been a lot of talk about it in the Democratic primary, in large part because the candidates are pretty much all agreed that, that and the, the most, I think, practically all of the top Democratic candidates were in favor of impeachment uh, before this inquiry mm -hmm. was begun. And, and then Biden came on board, I think, last. Uh, but uh, the other thing that I, I've been watching actually more closely is how this works in general elections, right? Because as Ed mentioned, we've had a couple of gubernatorial races in red states lately where there was a lot of bluster from the president and his, and his people about how impeachment was going to put the Republican over the top because it was so going to galvanize Republican-based voters. Right that even if they didn't feel like going out and voting, that would make them get off the couch. That doesn't seem to be the case, or at least it hasn't been enough for these Republicans who are counting on the president, who are counting on impeachment firing up their voters. It, it, the Democrats now, I think, have more confidence uh, about this not being politically dangerous for them because they haven't seen it affect their candidates in these deep red states. But Ramesh, you said with the sentencing and the seven guilty charges, I think, against Roger Stone, a former Trump associate, this week. You just put that as an exclamation point on what was a bad week for the president. But for Republicans, they're kind of able to brush it off. Well, the strategy is clearly to hold on to base Republican voters, not really to influence people who are in the middle, maybe is trying to decide what they think of the president. And they're moving from one argument to another, trying to come up with some stable ground from which to defend the president. And it's very tricky because the president mm -hmm. keeps undermining the defenses. So, for example, um, Jim Jordan, who we had on earlier, has said, said earlier this week, well, obviously what happened was the president wanted to give the new president of Ukraine some time, test him out, see if uh, he really was the real deal against corruption. Then the White House releases the first conversation between Trump and Zelensky where Trump says you can come visit the White House. He's not giving him time. It's what the real story here is. He is perfectly willing to have him over, and then later he decides, oh, wait, I can use leverage here to get an investigation of the Bidens. Mm -hmm. 
And the word corruption was not used in that phone right. call or the subsequent one in July. So um, and that's why they're flailing. They just have to keep coming up with new defenses. Molly, you're writing a book on Speaker Pelosi. I am. Out in April. What did you think <laughs> of what she described there in terms of the tone she's setting for this huge political decision? Well, you know, say what you will about Nancy Pelosi, she is extremely consistent. And she has been consistent since the beginning of this process, uh, first in expressing reluctance. She very much wants the American people to know that the Democrats aren't doing this because they're out to get the president. In fact, they don't want to do it, but they've been forced. Uh, and that continues to be her line. And then also trying to keep the focus off of partisanship. The fact is, this is a partisan impeachment. It was mm -hmm. uh, that when they had the vote, it was a almost purely party line vote. Only Democrats are for it. They can't do anything about that if the Republicans don't want to come along. Uh, but they, but she's trying as hard as she possibly can to cast this in nonpartisan terms to say it's about the country, it's about the Constitution, and trying to elevate this uh, and also make it seem like a big deal. I mean, this has also been part of the president's defense is just is uh, maybe not him, but people around him saying this just isn't that big a deal. Mm -hmm. It might have been bad, but it's not impeachable. There's 30 Trump scandals every week. Why is this any different? Mm -hmm. uh, and she very much is trying to elevate the seriousness. And, 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 you know, she's talking about bribery. She's talking about national security. Right. And that's what she was trying to drill into people's minds. Rachel, is that why uh, when I asked the speaker, she didn't want to respond to what the Republicans are saying about impeachment? Yeah, no, I uh, it was interesting because she did something similar at a press conference this week, uh, particularly regarding the argument that Democrats have yet to have a witness who has, quote, firsthand knowledge, a witness who can say, I talked to Trump. Trump was the one who directed the entire scheme. And, um, you know, that is a potential vulnerability for Democrats. Um, you can't deny that these witnesses nobody is able to sort of speak to that. However, it's sort of risky for Republicans to take this line of attack mm -hmm. because this week we're going to see Gordon Sondland is going to come in to testify. We don't know what he's going to say. But this is a guy who has told at least four other witnesses that Trump told him that the right. whole was directing the whole scheme the entire time. One of them even verified it with the White House to make sure he was talking to the president and not just making this up. And another person right. actually heard a conversation between the president and this ambassador. So I think it's it's risky. Pelosi right. didn't want to respond to it now, but next week we could see the tables turn. It's going to be a very big and busy week for all of us. We will be right back. Recently, we talked about the importance of listening to the quiet voices of the public servants being pulled into the spotlight of this impeachment inquiry. We heard three of those voices speak clearly and candidly this week, not about politics or partisanship, but about their concerns with the Trump administration's handling of foreign policy. They warned that the security of our own democracy is at risk. One moment that stood out to us was the applause and standing ovation for Ambassador Yovanovitch following her testimony, a sign of respect for a public servant at the end of a politically contentious hearing. Perhaps people are listening. That's it for us today. A big thank you to the Jones Day Law Firm for the facilities here on Capitol Hill. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.